The following is an encore presentation of Louisiana Public Square. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB, and joining me for tonight's discussion on healthy living is family physician and author, Dr. Ronnie Whitfield. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you so much, Beth. It's great to be here. You know, obesity is a condition that I see more and more in my practice. In fact, the latest state of obesity report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation ranks Louisiana first in the country for adult obesity. Unfortunately, that's not a surprising in a state where every social event becomes a food event and our cuisine attracts the tourists from all around the world. Well, that's certainly true. Yeah. But you know, if living a healthier lifestyle is one of your New Year's resolutions, tonight we're here to help. Ever wonder which diet is the most effective for shedding extra pounds? What weight loss surgeries are available and how safe are they? How much exercise do you need? And how can you eat healthily if you live in a food desert? Well, we've brought together doctors, nutritionists, researchers, and weight loss success stories to help you learn how to have a healthy new year. My name is Denisha Thomas. Since uh, that last summer, I've lost um, about 12 pounds, and I've also lost about 4% of my body fat. Denisha Thomas is a senior at LSU in the pre-med kinesiology program. During the fall semester, she participated in a trial weight loss program with Pennington Biomedical Research Center called Healthy Detours. It was designed by Dr. Valerie Myers. The summer before I started using the app, I was actually at the heaviest weight that I had ever been in my entire life. Uh, that came with back problems, that came with problems with self-esteem, um, people in my family were noticing. It was overall a little embarrassing. Through an app on her phone, Thomas was prompted to eat healthier, sleep better, and get more exercise. During the study, the app was uh, centered around the restaurants on and around campus. There were icons beside each restaurant's name that showed you if that restaurant had low-fat options, if that uh, restaurant had uh, options with a great amount of fiber um, or a nice amount of vegetables on their menu. She also learned to pre-plan her meals for the week. I would say before the study, I would say exercise was kind of like a cramp in my schedule. The resources on the phone actually made it very easy to um, completely understand what type of working out you were doing, how much was needed. So I realized if I go and jog around the lake, I only need to do that for 15 minutes for five days out of the week, which is completely and totally feasible. Kate Blumberg is a research dietitian at Pennington. She says this kind of education is key to making a diet sustainable and not just a short-term solution. The biggest problem people make when they are planning a diet is they don't have a maintenance plan. What are they going to do after they lose the weight? There are many diets to choose from, but most have the same principle. Almost any diet can work um, if it is reducing the amount of calories that people are consuming. You know, if you were eating whatever you wanted to begin with and now you're following something, um, most of the time you are reducing the amount of calories that you have. One trend is the low-carb diet. The premise of low-carb diet is that if you focus more on eating proteins and fats and less carbohydrates, your body is going to have to use your um, fat and your protein stores to burn energy. But if too few carbs are taken in, the body can go into something called ketosis. Which, you know, can help you burn calories quicker, but also can make you irritable, fatigued, tired, those type of things. But carbs are not the enemy, Blumberg says. In a lot of diets, they are seem to be the enemy. Um, but I think it's more the quality of the carbs that you are having. Um, so, you know, processed foods, chips, and, you know, 
a lot of foods with sugar in them and things like that. No, we don't need those, but our body does need fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Blumberg says there are pros and cons to meal replacement diets like SlimFast or Nutrisystem. Because a lot of times when people want to go on a diet, the thing they say is, well, I just don't know what to eat. And this just kind of eliminates that. Um, the problem with um, meal replacements is that, again, there's no plan for afterwards. It doesn't teach people anything. It doesn't teach them portion sizes or which food groups are healthy and which ones they need to stay away from. Pennington meal replacement studies often include education components that teach participants valuable nutrition lessons for after the study is over. Blumberg promotes the DASH diet, developed in part by research at Pennington. The DASH diet stands for the Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. So it basically was designed to try to see if they could reduce people's blood pressures. Um, but over the course of the studies that they've done, they have found that it not only reduced the blood pressures, but it reduced the risk of heart disease, diabetes, um, certain cancers, and of course also helped people with weight loss. DASH requires decreased sodium and saturated fats along with more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and low-fat dairy. If you're looking to start a diet, consult a dietitian for official advice. I truthfully believe that it is not one size fits all. Someone who loves to cook, um, who likes a lot of variety in their food and things like that, they are going to do terrible at a meal replacement type um, diet where they have to eat the same things over and over and they really don't have much time, you know, they don't really prepare them themselves. In Louisiana, a state where one in five residents live in poverty, it's not always easy for those of low socioeconomic backgrounds to get access to healthy options. Monica McDaniels is clinical services manager of the state's WIC program. In areas where uh, there are high incidents of uh, food des deserts, uh, the accessibility to uh, appropriate foods can be quite the challenge. Uh, transportation to the grocery store, a full line grocery store, may also be one of the challenges that our participants face. The WIC program, or the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, helps mothers who qualify choose healthy foods. The WIC program targets uh, uh, iron uh, nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, and zinc, uh, calcium, vitamin D. And uh, we have uh, food prescriptions. And uh, with that, there, will, there are only certain foods that uh, the participant will be able to purchase. No matter who you are, losing weight is about learning to make healthy choices. Because it is a lifestyle change. If you really want this to be long term, you have to learn how to make changes. Joining us to explore some of those changes is our studio audience. It includes individuals who are at different points in their healthy lifestyle journey. We'll hear what diets have worked for them, what fitness regimens they follow, and why some of them chose weight loss surgery. We'll also hear from folks who help underserved communities eat healthier. Thanks to everyone for being here. I want to toss out a few things before we get started. We created an online survey about this month's topic. Among the more than 125 respondents, we discovered the following. Of those taking the survey, 71% considered themselves overweight, 28% a normal weight, and less than 1% underweight. After using a body mass index chart, 43% fall under the overweight category, 25% fall under the obese category, and 15% in the extremely obese category. 17% come under the normal category. When it comes to carbohydrates, 24% eat four or more servings a day. 34% of the respondents eat three servings a day, 33% eat two servings a day, and only 9% eat one serving of carbs daily. For vegetables, 14% have them four or more times a day, 26% consume vegetables three times a day. Most respondents, about 34%, eat two servings a day, while 6% of respondents don't eat any vegetables during the day at all. 42% of respondents haven't tried dieting, but 25% tried their own plan. The most popular diet is Weight Watchers, tried by 21% of respondents, followed by the Atkins and Sugar Busters diet at 13 and 9% respectively. Some respondents have tried multiple diets. So let's start here, guys. What have you done to get in shape and what motivated you to start? We'll start with Monica. I'm 
Absolutely. Uh, my motivating factor was uh, not uh, working so much. I chose the field of nutrition. I'm a registered dietitian by trade. Right. So I chose the field of nutrition to keep me accountable, gotcha. uh, quite honestly. And uh, when life happens, uh, <laughs> childbearing years start. Uh, you see the freshman 15 and I think you see right. the, the married 20. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so uh, with, with everything going on, once the children uh, were, were independent enough to you know, complete their own homework, having a supportive husband, I was able uh, after uh, several years of uh, you know, being a nurturing mother and wife uh, to uh, redirect my and rechannel my energy back to exercise. Great, great. Yeah. So, and, and that, that is where my journey with increasing my uh, physical exercise okay. uh, began. Very good point. We're, we're female dominated on this panel, but Elmo, I'd like to ask you about your journey to, to weight loss and fitness. How did you get involved in this? Well, first of all, I give a lot of credit to uh, the people at Pennington because they have uh, educated me over the years. Mm -hmm. I've been on a number of uh, their studies. Probably the one that's been the most beneficial to me has been e-mechanic which basically was exercise okay and that helped a lot uh, it helped me to develop a routine for working out and even today a couple of years after I finished that study I'm still working out in the gym three to four times a week uh, in addition to that I'm a lifetime weight watcher right. so I've been very conscious of what I've eaten although the struggle is still before me so it definitely was a lifestyle change for you yes Lindsay, you, you had a different path. You, you, you were a little more strategic or surgical, might I say. How, how, how about your weight loss journey? Um, well, being a new mother and gaining weight, of course, I got to my uncomfortable weight and I wasn't, um, I guess you'd say confident anymore. Okay. Um, I tried several diets and they just didn't agree with me. I don't know if I just didn't stay with the plan or, right. you know, how... Um, my lifestyle was, especially with my husband's good cooking. <laughs> um, I went to the Aspen Clinic. I knew um, a few people that went there and they had very good success with it. I went, I had a good success with it. The pounds started dropping off immediately. They helped me with my diet plan, um, my grocery list and everything I needed to do. And um, here I am. Great. Well, from the surveys and talking to you guys, I know structure is important. But I like to also know what are some barriers, David? What do you think are some barriers to weight loss? What do people talk about? I always hear time is the is the biggest barrier. But what barriers might some folks face? Uh, I'd have to say food number one. <laughs> Louisiana cooking. <laughs> That's right. But uh, I I uh, had lost about 25 pounds myself. Uh, I um, I have a hard time. I I admire and respect uh, so many of these folks that you know, uh, count calories and carbs, and I just, uh, uh, to be honest with you, I'm, that's kind of a barrier to me. I, I, um, I'm able to, um, uh, to control my, my diet I, just by cutting down on uh, the amount of food that I eat okay. and uh, less alcohol. Yep. Uh, you know, we're kind of a party state, I guess. Those empty and, calories. And a wonderful uh, way of life here, but uh, I can cut down on calories by doing that. And uh, my family's pretty supportive. We don't eat a lot of processed foods. Okay. But, um, but anyway, I, I, think, uh, I think those alcohol, food, uh, those things uh, are sort of barriers. Uh, yeah, you, you hear that more calories, you know, in and less calories out, and that's how people continue to gain weight. Nurse Rowe. Uh, I'd be happy to say my nurses in the building, yes, and we have a different experience because we are battling with these patients constantly. What do you think the motivation for the patient would be as a healthcare provider? What can you do to, to motivate the patient? Well, I actually, you know, started my journey, you know, because I was listening to you tell patients, say, hey, look, you know, you can do this, that, you can decrease your carb, increase your activity increase your water intake mm -hmm. and I thought okay one day I went home and I said well I can listen to what Dr. Whitfield said <laughs> and do the same thing <laughs> right. and it started to come off and patients started to notice I didn't notice but patients started to notice and then I walked into the office one day and it was like wow I got on the scale and I said just those simple things of just saying hey look you can do it I'm gonna do it with you right so if, if I could do it if they could do it too you know, so that was my kind of attitude. Yeah, and and a lot of times patients, 
being someone who went through my personal journey, hired a nutrition coach and lost those pounds, I sometimes expect the same thing from my patients, didn't always get that. I want to shift tracks for a minute. Lisa, there are some folks, and I think in this room we're all okay, but there are some folks who just don't have access to healthy foods. What are the right. options? How can, we, how can we help those individuals? Well, um, I think mainly the fact that, you know, I, do, I am with the Red Stick Farmers Market and we provide markets awesome. <laughs> in North and South Baton Rouge areas. Uh, the ones that, that have been mostly challenging are the ones in the food desert areas. Right. So I think education is, is key to getting the, the word out about the, the if food travels less miles, then it's more nutritious than if it's coming from, you know, across seas or other countries or things like that. But access has been one of our major issues in the North Baton Rouge and the South Baton Rouge communities. But with the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative, okay. there was a, a quite a few programs that came out with that. And that was break on the go to increase the, the physical fitness in the school systems. And also we came with the mobile farmers market and the mobile food pantry just so we could provide food in those low income areas or the low food access areas. Right. So there have been different things put into place. It's just that you know, the community buy-in is the most important thing. Very like important. once they adopt that um, idea that, hey, we need to change our diets and think about their family members who suffer from diabetes and high <coughs> blood pressure, then that's how we kind of tackle that situation. Yeah, great, great. So we do have some options out there. By a show of hands, does anybody use anything unique, a, a Fitbit calculator, a higher personal trainer to help them in their process other than surgical procedures? By show of hands. Okay, not as many as I thought. Mona, what, what, what approach did you use to lose weight? Um, I've, That's a good answer. I've actually had the gastric sleeve. Okay. Um, yes. What prompted me to have the surgeries, I have a 11 year old and a 17 year old, right. and I've watched my mother die wow. from diabetes at the age of 62, and it was very difficult. And I didn't want to do that to my kids. So I decided after being diagnosed with insulin resistance, and also being diagnosed with some other health issues and I ended up being 40 BMI, I said I had to do something. And you took charge. And all my family and friends were like, oh, you, you look great, you look great. And I guess the way I carried my weight and stuff, I was evenly distributed over my body. Yeah. However, I was breathing very hard. Um, I was very wheezy. I couldn't do physical exercise like I used to, right. and I always been a gym rat. And I mean, I was in dance team for 18 years. I was a cheerleader growing up. I mean, I was always very active. But okay. once I started having kids, back to Monica's, you know, you, that childbearing and everything, and you get complacent. And life. Just, yeah, life. <laughs> yeah. So I decided to do this, and it's the, been the best decision. I've lost over 60 pounds in just a few months. Right. And um, I highly recommend it if those individuals can do it, if the other options don't work. Well, well congratulations on weight loss. Sorry about your mother's loss. But when we, when we address obesity, we can reduce our, or increase our lifespan uh, by, by reducing our risk for diabetes and heart disease. So it's very important that we use natural approaches as well. But sometimes those salvage <laughs> procedures are, are necessary. Okay. That's kind of all the time we have for that section. And I really appreciate you guys. We're coming back with some more questions. When we return, we'll be joined by our panel to further explore how to have a healthy new year. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight, we're discussing how we can live healthier in the new year. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Dr. Drake Bellinger is a bariatric surgeon with the Weight Loss Surgery Centers of Louisiana. Since 1997, he has performed over 2,000 weight loss surgical procedures, including gastric bypass and gastric banding. Dr. Catherine Champagne is a registered dietitian and professor at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. She helped to develop the DASH diet, which has been ranked number one by U.S. News and World Report for seven consecutive years. Wow. Rudy Macklin is the director of the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports for the past 23 years. Rudy has served as an advisor on health policy issues affecting underserved immigrants, refugees, and ethnic populations. 
and Stephanie M. Elwood is an Extension Associate with the Community and School Garden Programs at Southern University Ag Center. Her current work includes building nutrition education sites across the state and working to eradicate food deserts. Before we go to our audience, I'd like to ask you each briefly if you could give Louisiana a grade on its health. Dr. Bellinger. I'd give us a C plus. C plus, a little higher than I thought. Dr. Champagne. I'd give us a C minus. C minus, okay. Rudy? An F. An F. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Elwood? I would give us a C because we have lots of potential. <laughs> lots grow, of potential, lots of potential food. to grow. <laughs> uh, if you ask Dr. Whitfield, I'd probably give us a D, a D plus. And I, and I think that's dealing mostly with the obesity uh, epidemic that we have in our state. I want to toss some questions out to the audience now, so you guys help me out a little bit. Bianca, you had a question about the resources. Uh, could, you, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about what you were, were asking? Um, well, I work with uh, LSU Ag Center um, with the Healthy Communities Project okay. in rural um, St. Helena Parish. And sometimes we find that there may not be enough resources um, because it's not necessarily a food desert, but there's lack of access to different fresh foods, um, fr fruits and vegetables for the community there. Okay. So just wondering what type of resources are offered by the governor's initiative um, specifically with nutrition and physical activity. Great. Anyone in the panel would like to take that question? Oh, I guess it was directed toward me. I think so, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, with the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, you know, we concentrate on obesity instead of all the other health issues because when we deal with obesity, uh, it crosswalks with a lot of other uh, dis diseases and death, uh, hypertension, diabetes, upper respiratory uh, problems, even cancer. So if you can get a handle on obesity, you know, you really help reduce all the other uh, diseases and sicknesses around this, around the, around this state. Now, I travel the entire state, and uh, the thing that really gives me uh, great caution is the children. When I see children at 10, 11 years old with high blood pressure, when I see them with respiratory ailments, you know, that tells me that upcoming with our, our youth coming up to become adults, they're really gonna be sick uh, when they become adults. And so that really uh, makes me really concentrate and put a microscopic microscopic view on the rural areas in particular. Right, right. Therese, I think you had a question that, that, that Dr. Bellinger could probably address. Could you, could you ask Dr. Bellinger that question? Yes, as an HR professional, I'm always looking for opportunities to allow people to have good work-life balance. What, if any, programs does the state offer that might give businesses an incentive, a tax incentive, to offer more work-life balance programs in their work establishments. Well, maybe that was for, for Rudy instead of Dr. Bellinger. <laughs> okay, well, well, we have uh, what we call employee wellness programs. Uh, sometimes uh, with your employer, if you're involved in an employee wellness program, they'll give you a break on your premiums on your, on your health insurance. And we have a program called Own Your Own Health, where you can track your own physical activity and nutrition programs online as well as we have uh, city versus city uh, mm -hmm. uh, challenges going on. Uh, like we have Monroe versus Alexandria, uh, Bastion versus Tallulah, and uh, we're working on New Orleans versus Shreveport. And to give people uh, different ideas and, and uh, motivate them to be physically active and to, and to uh, move more. But from the employer standpoint, studies will show you that healthy employees are the better employees. It reduces their absenteeism, it boosts morale, and so when you have an employee work, uh, wellness program in your workplace, you have better employees and profitable employees as well. And so there are a lot of state uh, companies around now that are really going to that uh, particular thing when it comes to employee wellness. And we do it at the Louisiana Department of Health as well. And so you can just call my office and I'll help you get started. <laughs> Stephanie, I think you, now you're familiar with the resources as well. What other options are there available? Um. Well, I can tell you about the programming that we do at Southern at the Ag Center. Um, we work with different USDA grants. One of them was with Dr. Tiffany Franklin eradicating food deserts through the, the development of school gardens. So um, teaching health consciousness, also having gardens on campus, teaching the skill of how to grow, you know, from the seed to eating the broccoli. Um, we've also worked with incarcerated and adjudicated youth teaching gardening skills as well. Um, not only for eating healthy foods, but also landscaping and other opportunities. Um, and we're also involved with the Healthy Communities Grant in several parishes, um, Madison, Tensaw, and St. Helena. And um, Southern University um, 
focuses on the food desert neighborhoods and um, making more fresh produce available through uh, gardening efforts. Great, great. Dr. Champagne, you, you've done a lot of research. Were there any programming or things that you may have encountered during your research that, that are resources that may be helpful as well? Well, mostly we've done diet studies, um, looking at different types of diets, comparing diets, comparing strategies, and along with many of our, we, we do know that people can lose weight. Right. The problem is maintaining the weight loss. So any strategy that you can use, the one that I think is the most effective mm -hmm. for people who don't want to have surgery is to record the food that you eat. Because, and I will tell you based on our participants in the past, that's the most hated strategy, but the most effective strategy. Mm -hmm. It creates awareness of what you're putting in your mouth. And I think the concept then is that you actually can know how many calories is physically in there. We did that with a pounds loss study where we gave uh, participants menus and the concept was follow these menus but the, t the, the more long-term message was that when you see how much of each food group is on the plate then you could take that a step further and substitute other foods to right. make a difference. Make a difference. I want to shift gears a little bit. Dr. Bellinger, I do my best to keep my patients from coming to see you, <laughs> but I have been unsuccessful in that. <laughs> Obesity is truly an epidemic. Could you elaborate on that patient that comes in that you have to address? In many cases, I have patients that I don't think need the procedure, but there are many cases now that you're, you're having to do these surgical procedures. They're salvage procedures. Uh, yeah, I think one of the greatest indications and one of the best indications for weight loss surgery is diabetes. Right. So diabetes, not only are we getting a person to lose weight, so things like high blood pressure mm -hmm. and sleep apnea tend to go away as well, right. makes the overall health of the patient better, but there's an intrinsic process within the operation that starts the reversal process of right. diabetes. So not only does the weight loss help uh, lessen mm -hmm. the impact of diabetes, right. but something within the surgery as well uh, the operation reverses some of those effects by the chemical changes that it causes. Wow. So reversing diabetes, uh, reducing blood pressure. I've had patients that have come off all their medications after a salvage procedure and it's, it's done wonders. Um, we have one of your patients here and I just, Tiffany, I, I tell me I'd like for you to share maybe a little bit of what happened but uh, you had a question as well. So you, were, you had surgery by Dr. Bellinger. What led you to that and, and um, how are you doing? I did. Thank you for having me here. Yes ma'am. Uh, um, I had the gastric sleeve uh, three years ago this past August and I guess my motivation was I was tired of um, comfort eating. Um, my child was called home coming up on seven years and um, it, it just it just it, it was just a, a, a horrible eating habit you know I was trying to comfort myself with food and it, I just wasn't getting anywhere and I needed a major jump start and um, I, I, I was um, back and forth yo-yo you know dieting and it, it, it just wasn't helping at all and um, I had uh, encountered um, several people who uh, Dr. Bellinger himself uh, had performed weight loss surgery on them and uh, you know I just took a look at myself my life you know and I said you know God may have called one of my uh, children home one of my girls home but I have two other girls to live for and um, I'm not I'm not gonna live very long if I continue with this way, you know, and, and, and then it was, um, you know, high blood pressure and the fear of going to the doctor and say, well, congratulations, Miss Lear, you, you're, you, you're successful on becoming a diabetic. So mm -hmm. I said, you know, I deserve it. I need a quick jump start. And um, I saw Dr. Uh, met with Dr. Ballinger. And um, from there, I've just, I've just taken off. I've done it. I've maintained it. Maintain. I've changed my eating right. habits. I've even um, learned how to cook uh, healthier for my family. And um, so, you, so you'd recommend Dr. Bellinger? 
Well, Absolutely. <laughs> I kind of got the feeling that you would. So we. It's just been a great. It's, it was. It was just a great, de great decision. I, I am very glad that I made that decision to do that because it, it just wasn't working trying to do it on my own. You know, I'd lose weight, gain it, lose weight, gain it, and um, it, it just. You know, I just wasn't living a healthy life. You know, I exercised so you, you, 15, 20 miles a week right. and I watched my carbs, you know. Um, so it just, and Dr. Bill, she said she had a key, key point. It's not just a surgery. After the surgery, there's life after surgery. What recommendations are you giving patients? What happens after the salvage procedures? Uh, we like to follow our patients. We follow them very closely for the first year while they're in the, uh, the weight loss phase. Uh, right after surgery and then we want to follow them for an additional five years Wow! Uh, and part of and, and most of the programs here around the state have uh, been accredited as centers of excellence to perform bariatric surgery and weight loss surges bariatric surgery um, and one of the things that you must show that you want to do or you have to do is follow the patients for five years okay. because that's when they hit the mark where you know that chances are that weight loss will be maintained for a, a very long time if they make it through five years. Awesome, awesome. Robert, I haven't heard from you. Um, you had some questions <laughs> about uh, educational programs and, and eating healthy, and also we've mentioned cooking. And, but before I get to you, Robert, how many people cook? Show of hands. <laughs> Lindsay, <laughs> we've got to get rid of this fast food thing. So, so, so Mr. Robert, what, what was your question in regards to, to healthy eating? And well, I think it, like Rudy alluded to, it has to start at a young age uh, with education, educational programs. Um, and the times when I was growing up, you know, we just ate pretty much anything we wanted to. Yeah. And my mother would always say, you're eating too many starches, <laughs> get off the starches. And I'd say, well, no. You know, I was hard-headed, and now I'm paying for it because I'm diabetic. So we just need more education in this state because we all love to eat. I mean, we just it's just a happy, uh, drinking, eating state. And so we need to just, with a new mayor and the new governor, we need to come up with more programs. Pennington's been great to me. I'm a project at Pennington. So. Right, right. Tiffany, you, you went a little different route. I think you tried some exercise and diet first. And could you t could you share your story? I uh, yeah. Um, I back in 2010 was in an accident where I broke my ankle bilaterally, and I was in a wheelchair for a year. We didn't know if I was going to walk. Um, and I got really depressed, and I gained a lot of weight. My highest weight was up to 367 pounds. Mm. And after that, I tried working out. I tried using local parks, local. Um, facilities that were available to us. Um, I work for Breck, so we have many wonderful facilities around here that you can utilize, and it just wasn't working because it was a mindset that I had gotten into, and um, until I was able to correct my mindset, I wasn't able to get to that, but the catalyst was when my husband got sick. He um, just had diabetes since he was two, and four years ago, he was diagnosed with kidney failure, and that kidney failure, his doctor told me, he said, ma'am, you are not going to be around long enough to help take care of your husband because wow. we don't know if your husband's going to make it to get a transplant. He needed a kidney and pancreas transplant, and yeah. apparently that's rare. So um, I did the surgery. That was the route that we decided to go because I needed something that was, and it's not a quick fix, but I needed something that was permanent, that was going to be more lasting, something that I could wrap my mind around instead of things that to me just weren't working um, and in the long run since then my husband and I both have been successful with that and he has since gotten his pancreas and kidney transplant Wonderful. Mm -hmm. due to himself having weight loss surgery um, mm -hmm. so together we've lost almost 400 pounds total mm -hmm. together but because of that that's giving us a new lease on life we've been able to be more active together now this past September, for our anniversary, we hiked to the top of Mount Conti in Gatlinburg. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And without that, without the um, experience of changing our mindset, changing our lifestyles, realizing that we got to those places because of things that we have done or not have done, um, that's why we're here. That's why we're able to be here. 
Right. I mean, motivation seems to be key in everyone's oh. conversation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Champagne, any experience with individuals that just can't get motivated, can't get this done? Well, we actually, when we do a, a lifestyle um, intervention, motivation and relapse prevention, mm -hmm. time management, stress management, all of those concepts are embedded into the the, the intervention. Um, one thing that's important is that, um, and, and I, I know this is sort of off the subject, but you know, when you talk about diets, almost any diet will work if you follow it. Um, there's, you can lose weight on low carb diets, high carb diets, low fat diets, higher fat diets, but the key is counting calories. And the unfortunate thing about some of the low carb diets is that if you restrict carbs, you restrict fiber. And so therefore, you may be more prone to uh, colon cancer. Right. So the American diet, unfortunately, is too low in fiber and it needs to be much higher, probably double what normal people, what people normally would consume. Right. Mm. But you're right, motivation, um, just a case in point, we had a study going on at Pennington right around Hurricane Katrina. And a year after Hurricane Katrina, people were still finding excuses <laughs> not to be able to stick to their diet because they had to, they had people in their house and they couldn't be uh, unkind and not let them cook bad food for them. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was an interesting um, time, but you know, family pressures and a lot of those really factor in, you know, we know people can make a change, but like I said, sustaining the change and carrying it forward are the key things. Well, you, you came up, Doc, with a, a wonderful diet, the DASH diet, which yes. you, I would, would like for you to define that for our audience. But many of my patients battle with busy schedules, children, and eating out. Mm -hmm. um, every now and then, Dr. Whitfield eats out. But, <laughs> but I, we try to cook at home. Um, I'm, I'm newly married, so my, my, my wife enjoys cooking, so I'm very fortunate. <laughs> what are your thoughts on eating out, preparing food? We had a discussion about that a little earlier. We did have a discussion <laughs> about that. Um, you know, we had a study where we told people they could only eat out once or twice a week, and that was not a very good message. But, you know, the reality is when you eat out, you really need to know what you're eating, and there are strategies that you can use. You know, you can order food that doesn't have added fat. You could have your salad dressing on the side. You know, there are many, many other strategies that can be used. But, um, you know, in terms of the DASH diet, the DASH diet was designed to be a healthy diet and for the seventh year in a row it is still the healthiest diet by US News and World Report. Right. It is not the first diet for weight loss although if you count calories and you know about the food groups you can make very positive changes and it could be a more nutrient dense as opposed to an energy dense diet. Um, I'm gonna switch tracks we have someone from Brita here I'd like, uh, I'd like Lisa to tell me a little bit about Brita uh, and, and just define what you guys are doing to help our community stay healthy. Well, um, Breda is a, a I'm sorry, Breda. Right, yeah. Breda <laughs> is a nonprofit, and um, we support small local farmers here in, Louis in the state of Louisiana. And um, they have opportunity to bring their products to our markets so they can reach the individuals here in the Baton Rouge area. And also some of our producers go out to markets in the Crescent City area. It's uh, not statewide, though. The is it statewide, the program? Uh, well, Breda's part is statewide. Okay. We're just here, located just here in Baton Rouge, okay. North and South Baton Rouge. And um, one of our main goals with, uh, once we received uh, the, the funding to do the mobile farmers market, which were to target the food desert areas, we went out into those areas like Scotlandville and um, maybe it's Glen Oaks area, okay. South Baton Rouge. Uh, even over near Gus Young, Star Hill Church, we, we provided a pop-up market there. And uh, uh, we targeted uh, mostly, you know, seniors who, because our markets come between that times between eight and two o'clock. Okay. So we would have a lot of seniors, a lot of retirees, some folks that were disabled. But the key to that is that if we had those who work during those hours, we have the Saturday's market downtown. Okay. So it's an opportunity for everybody in the state, of, in, in Baton Rouge area, 
to have access to local fresh produce here and uh, that you know that comes from here in Louisiana. So fresh is best and try to eat seasonal? Am yeah, I correct in that? yeah, All mainly. Right. Right. That's yeah. my thing. Yeah. I'm a seasonal person. All right. All right. Uh, it's a lot of times when I it's, it's things are not in season or either we'll have a uh, bad weather conditions and our farmers aren't growing a lot of vegetables so you won't get and it. we may have to go out to other places to get our fresh vegetables but for the most part, if it's in season, that's what my family is going to have. That's going to eat that. Yeah. Is there what you you work around the state? Can you first of all, I want to define to our audience what food deserts are, but what are you doing around the state to address um, these? Well, issues? I work with our SNAP Ed and FNET programs, um, teaching nutrition education. We have nutrition educators throughout okay. the state, um, Southern Nutri Ag Center nutrition educators, and what I do is I go in if it's a fitting site, I help them build a garden okay. to have on their site, maybe at a Council on Aging, maybe at a Head Start. Um, where they can actually learn how to grow, um, actually harvest, and you know continue it seasonally. We have a lot of presence in Baton Rouge and in food, de food desert areas as well. Are you surprised that that we don't know about this anymore? That we just become too urban? People aren't growing and and living as they should. Well, um, <laughs> I've taught maybe close to 2,000 students, you know, I, I, I'm maybe more, and a lot of times I have a lot of resistance to, I don't want to get my nails dirty, I don't want to get my shoes dirty, wow. but <laughs> I am telling you right here, right now, that once a student or an adult touches the soil with their hands, there's no going back. They enjoy it, they love it, <laughs> and it's something that we all have in common. It's something that we all have in our ancestry, and it's something that we all should reconnect with if we haven't. Um, and having that skill of knowing how to grow your own food can go a long way. You can take it with, with you for the rest of your life. But a food desert, according to the USDA, right. um, a food desert in urban areas is um, a neighborhood with low, low access to fresh produce. So you don't have a supermarket within walking distance. In an urban area, that's within one mile. Okay. Um, and in a rural area, it's within 10 miles. Uh, oftentimes within food deserts you have low access to transportation okay. so if you can't walk to the supermarket within one mile you're taking the bus um, it's very very difficult to retrieve uh, fresh produce so um, one one idea one creative way to um, combat that is learning how to grow your own food in your backyard if wow. you don't have to go to the store to get those collard greens if you can have them in your backyard and have a continuous flow throughout the fall then that's a blessing. My dad had a farm, a, a little mini garden in the backyard, and we'd shoot basketball, take those tomatoes, rinse them off, and eat them, <laughs> eat them like apples. Beautiful. So I think we need to get back to That's that. That's right. Monica, you, 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 you are very resourceful, and uh, would, I would just want you to mention some things about the WIC program and, and what you have going on. Uh, we partner and collaborate with uh, a lot of the, the panelists uh, here. Uh, we work with uh, the SNAP Ed and the SNAP educators come into the WIC clinics okay. and uh, provide services uh, and teach uh, our uh, WIC participants uh, from time to time across the state of Louisiana. We also work with Breda uh, with the farmers markets where we highly encourage our uh, WIC participants to uh, come and participate and purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. There's a matching program. Okay that we have with uh, the market umbrella in the greater New Orleans area. And we're also expanded into uh, Alexandria, Lake Charles, as well as Shreveport at this point okay. uh, with uh, assisting our WIC participants in uh, securing and purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. In 2009, the USDA approved uh, uh, the WIC program to uh, serve or provide uh, whole grains so whole grains are added to the food package okay. as well as the fresh the choice of uh, fruits and vegetables the state of Louisiana opted to provide fresh uh, only wow. uh, fruits and vegetables because we are an agricultural state okay. and uh, we you know from the from infancy to adulthood with our uh, childbearing age women uh, we want them to have the uh, opportunity to be able to purchase fresh and prepare fresh right. for their families to introduce to the children because like Rudy said, it starts uh, very young with uh, regard to introducing uh, new food ideas and getting our children acclimated to uh, healthy exercise as well as uh, healthy eating. Right, right. We, we had a very interesting uh, dialogue prior to the show and I just wanted David to, to share a little bit of his, his story. Uh, it was pretty amazing and, and we're just glad that you're doing well. Oh, it was a great journey. Um, <clears throat> as my wife has stated, at two years old, 
I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is uh, juvenile. Juvenile, right. Um, learned how to take my own insulin shots. Supposed to learn how to eat like I was supposed to. Never did want to do that because going through the teenage years, I rebelled. Um, mm -hmm. Family issues, I didn't have my mom around. My dad worked. So I just did whatever it took to get by. Okay. Um, in 2013, I got diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. Wow. So my, I had kidney failure. How, how old were you then, Dave? I was 32 years old, um, and it was in November of 2013, um, and one of the uh, vascular surgeons, she had performed what's called the AV fistula so they can connect the major artery and a vein together to do dialysis in my arm. Um, when I started that, high blood pressure, wow. um, sleep apnea, um, um, and then I got told by the doctor, you can, you're not able, you're not able to get a transplant unless we do a kidney and a pancreas because just the kidney, my diabetes would tear my kidney up automatically. But you had to lose weight and right. Do, and I was at 289 pounds, okay. and they said I need to be down uh, to at least 170. Wow. I've tried different diets, and the problem I had was being a diabetic on a diabetic diet. I didn't necessarily need being on dialysis due to high phosphorus levels, um, calcium, um, different foods that I would eat would contradict to the other diet, and that diet would contradict that one, and wow. I ended up getting sick more than I did losing weight. And I've uh, spoken with a doctor out of Hammond, Louisiana, who agreed to do a gastric sleeve. Gastric sleeve, okay. Mm -hmm. He'd done the gastric sleeve, uh, kept extra watch on me, called. He personally called every month just to check on me, see how it was going, see how the healing was going. The nutritionist worked with me uh, on the shakes to see which would work good with me. Um, I ended up going from 289 pounds down to 167 pounds. Awesome. And I received a kidney pancreas transplant in December of 2015. You look great, Dave. Thank you. Oh, I feel great. Um, since then, um, it, the, the road recovery is hard, but I find that eating right, having to live for my sister to watch her graduate high school and college, raising her, motivation, um, my wife. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a service dog. She keeps me. Yeah, who's, who's <laughs> who you have with you there? She keeps me exercise. This is Pichouette. Pichouette. Hey, Pichouette. All right. Pichouette. Yeah, right. P-I-S-C-H-O-U-E-T-T. -T. Dr. Bellinger, how, how common is, is, is this story? How common is the scenario? How safe are these procedures? And maybe even share some of the different type of procedures that you guys are doing for weight loss. Uh, well, for weight loss, uh, the surgical procedures we have are the gastric banding, which has fallen out of favor, okay. uh, so you won't see it as much. But the main two are gastric bypass and the vertical sleeve. Okay. Uh, in David's uh, particular situation, the gastric sleeve is probably the best okay. because the um, medications that you're going to need for a transplant patient right. uh, have to be monitored very closely and they have to be absorbed more reliably. Okay. And the vertical sleeve is the, the procedure of choice for that because it doesn't alter the absorption of medications. Wow, wow. So this is a, something that's commonplace. This is not unusual, his situation at all? No, it's not. Wow, wow. Oh. Yeah. 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 Could I ask uh, Dr. Champagne? Yes. From Pennington, a question. Um, like I said, my main problem, I tried the diet, uh, renal diet, diabetic diet, doesn't necessarily go together. Um, has, I'm not familiar with Pennington because I'm originally from Texas. Right. Um, do y'all have anything, I guess, researched or in specific, maybe in files I can look at, or anybody going through my same situation can try before having to ultimately forego a uh, gastric sleeve, which is, uh, right. would be a bonus. Well, you know, in terms of your particular situation, I think that relying on a dietitian who can compare the two diets and that you need to be on like the diabetic diet versus um, a renal diet could give you a lot of advice in terms of you know what foods would be best for you to consume versus which ones perhaps to avoid but yeah. we um, it's too bad that we don't have the resources for to cure everyone's right. uh, <laughs> you know needs because you know a lot of people who are just a little bit overweight are wanting to make changes and come to see us, but sometimes they don't qualify because they're not fat enough. Right. No. Which is, you know, and I, I really think that's sort of 
difficult because, you know, sometimes people are a little bit overweight and they just want to lose a little bit of weight mm -hmm. to make a difference and get to a point where they don't ever have to worry about becoming obese. Are there any ongoing studies, um, Doc, that you could reference us to? Well, we have done some studies with weight wa on Weight Watchers, and the new Weight Watchers program is changing as a result of a study that was joint between Pennington and several other, four or five other centers throughout the state. So, you know, Pennington is, you know, trying to be on the forefront of helping to decide what might be best for people in terms of a, a diet. We actually did a bariatric uh, study called Heads Up. Dr. Bellinger here was one <laughs> of our uh, weight loss uh, surgeons. Awesome. And uh, it, was, it was really a terrific study and I wish it could have gone on for more years, but we are able to follow some of the people up to five years. Awesome. And are looking f for funding Ah, to actually continue. try to continue following those people who had bariatric surgery. Guys, we're kind of we're coming close. Uh, Rudy, I want to ask you one real quick, and then I want some closing thoughts from each of you. An obese child makes an obese adult. How true is that statement, and how important is exercise uh, in our young people? Well, the thing is, uh, parents have to be really cognizant of the fact that there's a time when you have to say no. Uh, no to certain <coughs> foods and, and, and sugary uh candy and things like that. Uh, you spring have to watch time. Springtime, that's true. But uh, the biggest problem with childhood obesity to me, not only you have to have uh, good physical education in schools, but after school. Huh. I've always noticed that there are kids who uh, try for basketball teams or football teams, the kids that don't make it, the kids that don't, are not the best athletes, what happens to them, okay? okay? We have so many specialized sports uh, sports are very expensive, you know, like soccer costs hundreds of dollars, uh, baseball costs hundreds of dollars, and in uh, low-income communities, those kids can't afford to play those sports. And so what we do with the Governor's Council of Fitness, we go in and create sports uh, and tournaments in those areas where they can't afford it, because if not, then it's going to wander the streets and have nothing to do and eat all the wrong things. So we have to make sure that in order to keep our kids busy and to find those programs that will allow their kids to have something to do after school and in the summertime, which is really when they're vulnerable. But we have a lot of programs with the Governor's Council on Fitness, with our elementary fitness competition, and the Governor's Games, where we address all those things at the same time. Well, I'll tell you guys, I worked with Rudy for over seven years, and mm -hmm. he's done some great work and made some changes, and he's very old. Um, <laughs> I would like to close, uh, Ms. L, with any closing words for our panelists and, 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 and the group today, the audience. I, I would like to leave everyone with um, just a simple sentence, and that is, if a kid grows kale, a kid will eat kale. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mackle? Well, I would just like to say, let's uh, try to, when you start any type of uh, new diet or exercise program, do not do it by yourself. Okay. Always have a partner, because or partners. The more partners you have, because there's going to be some days we're not going to be feeling like working out or eating right, Sometimes we fall off the wagon, but when you have partners like these two that are working together, your diet and your exercise are going to last a long time. Without champagne. To add to that, social support is very important in mm -hmm. all of our weight loss studies. And we are doing some work with child nutrition uh, in the state, but I want to um, stress that a child is at school for a short part of the day, right. so the example set by the parents is key to uh, good child nutrition habits. And we have at Pennington, we have at the Farmer's Market on Thursday. Awesome. Thursday yeah. from 8 to 12. 8, 8 to 12. 12. All right, all right. Dr. Bellinger? Um, I would say that when you have a big goal of losing weight, uh, it's best to achieve it by setting multiple small goals right. so that you can achieve those goals much more easily in your ultimate goal of uh, losing a lot of weight. You recommend journaling? Yes, definitely, definitely. Definitely keeping track. And Dr. Whitfield will give you his five points to healthy living. Know your doctor, know your numbers, know your family history, eat healthy and exercise. And we try to emphasize that to our patients. But more importantly, you, you, you got to go to the doctor. We can't, make, we can't diagnose the problem if you don't see the doctor. Many patients come in with diabetes and high blood pressure and haven't been seen for years. After Katrina, we would see folks 
five and six years going without their medications and it's very scary when someone walks in. David, you've had to deal with that and you see what can happen when, when things go untreated for long periods of time. I just want to thank the panelists and the audience. You guys were awesome. This was a great session. Hopefully we can do something like this again uh, and keep everyone motivated to eat healthy this year. We've run out of time uh, for our questions and answers segment. We'd like to again to thank our panelists, Dr. Bellinger, Dr. Champagne, Mr. Macklin, and Ms. Elwood for their insight on this month's topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing moments. Well, I'm inspired. I'm going to go out and try and eat a, a healthier diet. Okay. I can't. I don't promise that I'm going to cook more, though. Oh, no, you got to do it, Beth. You got to cook. My husband's a good cook. Okay, well, we'll take that. Just <laughs> we'll low, cat, low, low, low calorie, low fat. Low calorie, low fat. But, you know, it is hard in Louisiana. It is. Because we have such tasty food. Tasty food. And as you said, you know, all of our social activities, from tailgating to holidays around that. Parties, bar mitzvahs, whatever. And whatever. We're, we're, we're eating. Whatever. We're eating. And so, consequently, we really have to just keep that in mind. And I think portion control is it's perhaps key. one of the biggest things we've been talking about Definitely. as well. Don't want to deprive anyone of healthy or, or, or good eating, but we got to limit those things and, 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 and make healthier choices. Well, fresh is best. Well, I'm, go, to the, go to those fresh markets on the weekend. I, I buy them. <laughs> I don't necessarily cook it. I got you. <laughs> that's my problem. <laughs> Although, well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While you're there, comment on tonight's show, and we would love to hear from all of you. Thank you for joining us this evening, and thanks for being our guest host. It was Thank great. You. Awesome. Good night, everyone. Good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.